comments and then bring up uh, the PowerPoint for presentations. Um, I would appreciate if you would mute when you're not talking and that if during the talks you want to make a comment or ask, uh, you use the, uh, the feature, the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and send it to all so other people can see what you're commenting on. Um, and then uh, we have some points where you're going to pause and Anne de Peister very kindly is going to uh, moderate those questions, but uh, she's going to read back ones that she um, if there are multiple ones that are the same, she'll bring them together and pose some questions. And that way, people who are on iPhones or on uh, phones that don't have pictures can know what the questions are uh, that are being asked. Um, last week, someone helpfully was taking notes, uh, but didn't mute their computer so we could hear the of the of the keys. So if you uh, if you are taking notes or something else, it'd be very helpful if you. Uh, hit the little uh, mute button in the bottom left-hand corner of your computer. Um, but uh, so what I'm bringing up now, oh, and, and I want to thank uh, Anne DePeister again, is going to be moderating, and uh, the Reverend Mother Crystal Harden, who is the uh, Associate Rector of St. George's Arlington, will be leading us in prayers today. And uh, Greg, thank you for... Uh, providing the technical assistance for today's service. And I realized I can't bring up the screen unless I actually have it up. So it's gonna take me a second here to... I'm waiting for my PowerPoint to appear so I can share it. And as I do that, I, I do want to uh, point out something that I think probably everyone noticed and I will uh, touch on today. And, and that is that the, um, the newspapers in the last week have carried again the story about the discovery of the Thomas Bray School in Williamsburg. It was, uh, the building was identified several years ago and uh, it has been in the news uh, about once a year when something happens. So there was a recent celebration and that celebration uh, was covered in the news. It's coming up. Uh, you, you have a choice of in your upper right hand corner of gallery or of speaker view. And if you're trying to squint at the slides I'm using, you will do better with speaker view. And if you discover that your thumbnails of people block the screen, you can move that around with your cursor so that you do not, uh, it's not in the way. I want to begin just uh, with two things that I mentioned last week. Uh, and didn't, um, it wasn't entirely clear about. Uh, there was some conversation about the way in which Native Americans and uh, had been treated under uh, the Jim Crow era. And there's an excellent book which talked about um, the experience of both um, Native Americans and uh, most importantly, African Americans in the Jim Crow era uh, called Managing White Supremacy. It's by J. Douglas Smith, whose father, um, uh, is John Smith, who was once the rector of St. James in Leesburg. His grandfather is Armstead, was Armstead Booth, who uh, ran against Harry Byrd for the Senate in the 1950s and lost, but uh, was more progressive on matters of race uh, at that point. The, um, the window on the right is from St. John's Hampton, which was a congregation in Virginia that did uh, a great deal um, of work with Native Americans in the 19th and the early 20th century. This is their Pocahontas window. They had a Native American choir 
And uh, one of the things that I liked about the congregation is when in the uh, late 19th century, the Diocese of Southern Virginia announced that uh, they would no longer keep track of Native Americans, but would simply divide all people into white and uh, colored, uh, white and non-white. Um, the, uh, the, the rector kept reporting the number of Native Americans in the congregation uh, each year, kind of uh, flowing against the stream and trying to, uh, to hold out a recognition of the ministry they had in that place. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's a window you can see at St. John's Hampton to this day. I wanna talk about the 18th century. Um, and one of the things that's important to recognize in the missions of the 18th century was that for most of the 17th century and particularly from about 1625 until 1689, there were as monarchs in England, monarchs who had relatively little interest in the state of the Anglican church in the North American colonies, the Episcopal church. This is a picture of the, the uh, James II who was, became king in 1685. There is a little jingle that uh, sometimes uh, people in England memorize uh, to memorize their kings. And their ones, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for the, for the 17th century are James, Charles, Charles, and James. They sure look nice in picture frames. Um, they seem to have spent a lot of time on their dress and were uh, very happy about that. What they didn't spend much time about, particularly um, James II and his brother who preceded him, Charles II, is the um, fate of the Church of England and uh, the Church of England in its colonial holdings. Uh, Charles and James's mother was a Roman Catholic princess uh, from France, um, and they, um, Charles became a Roman Catholic uh, and converted on his deathbed. James had already joined the Roman Catholic Church um, in 1668 or 69. He concentrated much of his religious policy when he did think about matters of religion um, on improving the state of the Roman Catholic Church, bringing a Roman Catholic nuncio, putting a Roman Catholic at the head of, head of uh, Oxford or Cambridge, uh, drawing up a standing army uh, with the Roman Catholic as its head. And uh, one of the results of that was there's a long period of time uh, prior to 1688 in which there doesn't seem to be any royal policy about religion in the American colonies. And um, in 1687, there was no organized colonial Anglican church on the North American continent outside of Virginia. So if you're an Anglican, you went to almost anywhere else, you couldn't find a parish and there was no organized attempt to, to create parishes. So the American colonies became a kind of, uh, if you will, safety valve for groups that were not appreciated or felt they were not appreciated in England uh, or in Scotland uh, or in Ireland would come to the colonies and uh, establish, establish their own colonies. And um, though, in England to this day, um, clergy are chosen by patrons. Uh, and though the monarchs of England claim to be the patrons of the colonies in America, they made no attempt to appoint clergy uh, for the colonies or to assist in that effort. Um, that is how the colony of Virginia began to, uh, uh, vestries took over the responsibility, which they still don't have in England for choosing clergy because nobody else was doing it. All of this changed in 1688 when Mary, who was the daughter of James's first Protestant wife and her sister uh, and her husband, who was also uh, her cousin, um, William of Orange, um, led a revolution ejecting James II from the crown, from the throne. And uh, took over the crown themselves. Uh, William Macaulay, the, the great 19th century uh, English historian um, is often called the, uh, the leading Whig historian, but his point of view was that this was the most wonderful thing that ever happened in English history. 
uh, a so-called bloodless revolution in which a Roman Catholic despot was ejected from the throne. And um, uh, he uh, popularized the term the glorious revolution. So uh, some later historians have pointed out that it wasn't as bloodless as uh, Macaulay suggested. Uh, but in fact, um, William, uh, James sent out an army to fight the uh, William and Mary and the army defected to William and Mary. And uh, this, uh, in any case, um, so uh, they rule jointly. Mary dies, William rules, William dies, and then Anne takes over and follows her uh, sister and brother-in-law to the throne. Um, the revolution, act two of the, of the glorious revolution was the Toleration Act in 1689 that gave uh, toleration uh, to multiple religious groups in, the, um, in England and in Scotland. Now, one of the reasons this made a difference in the colonial church is that uh, Mary and Anne had had a tutor when they were growing up, uh, who was Henry Compton. He became the Bishop of London. And uh, he remained on the throne before and after the Glorious Revolution, reigned on the, uh, in his chair as bishop. And he started doing lots of things for the first time, trying to come up with this, some concerted way to carry on missions in the colonies of England on the continent. His uh, first move, which was a very smart one, was he took an, uh, an old custom in Europe and that was the custom of commissaries. Now commissaries uh, as a, are persons, uh, not stores uh, in the English sense, uh, but, but they are persons with a commission from the bishop to administer some part of the bishop's diocese or some responsibility of the bishop's diocese. And so bishops with rather large dioceses would appoint commissaries for outlanding landing areas, which they were unable or unwilling to visit. What Henry Compton did was he began to appoint commissaries for the colonies, beginning with Virginia, which had an established church in 1684. He introduced uh, a man, John Clayton, as commissary. And then uh, he was quickly followed by James Blair, uh, a Scot who came to Virginia, lived at Williams uh, in Williamsburg and would remain at the commissary for about 50 years. So uh, James Blair would stay for a long time and become the first uh, long-term colonial colon, uh, commissary. He lobbied on behalf of the church. He uh, complained when he thought the church was mistreated by governors. He tried to discipline clergy uh, who were uh, guilty of misconduct. And he generally uh, led the uh, church uh, to a uh, improved status. He also established the College of William and Mary in 1693 as the third colony in, college in America after Harvard and Yale. And uh, he revived initially the effort which had begun in the days of John Smith and Pocahontas uh, to create uh, schools for Native Americans as a tool for the conversion and for the edification of Native American people. It had two parts. Uh, there was a, a building at William and Mary College, I think Brereton Hall, which was set aside for Native Americans uh, who, enjoy, who joined the student body. And at Fort Christiana, uh, a school was set up, a secondary school to, tr to provide training for people so that they could have the qualifications to go to William and Mary. And, uh, early on, it had about 70 students. So there was a, an effort uh, at the same time working independently, a clergyman in South Carolina uh, created a school uh, for Native Americans as well. So by um, 1720, there were uh, up and active uh, schools for Native Americans uh, as there had been uh, early on uh, in the colony. And uh, Compton, uh, working together with the monarchs uh, and with members of parliament, uh, helped expand uh, establishments so that 
in addition to laws supporting the Church of England in Virginia, similar laws were created in Maryland, South Carolina, Georgia, Nova Scotia, and finally in North Carolina. And there also was an early uh, somewhat failed experiment, but uh, the first effort was to expand um, the establishment to include New York. And a Anglican governor convinced the parliament to adopt a resolution. And they use the same kind of ang language uh, that they use in England that this was to be the establishment of the Protestant religion. Um, and uh, two things happened. Number one, um, the legislature never agreed expanding behind the beyond the six counties that were then in existence. Uh, and secondly, no one could agree what the Protestant religion was. Uh, and so uh, Presbyterians said, well, that means that we should have tax support. And Congregationalists said we should have tax support. And Dutch Reform people said we should have tax support. And so it didn't actually function, but it was an interesting experiment uh, in uh, attempting to establish. But from Maryland further south, eventually there would be an established Church of England in all those places. Now, in areas, including New York, but in other areas that are outside of the South, um, individual congregations were established, often with gifts and grants and financial aid coming from England. So uh, very rapidly after 1688, there was the first parish in Massachusetts, in Pennsylvania, in New York, in Rhode Island, in New Jersey, and in Connecticut. So there you can see 1688 is kind of the magic year, but then they, uh, by 1707, you've got uh, some Anglican representation uh, everywhere except New Hampshire. So there's a, a rather uh, rapid expansion of the, um, of the presence of Anglican churches. When uh, William died and came to the throne, uh, I've heard um, a phrase used sometimes, but I've, I've not been able to figure out where it comes from. Some people talk about Anne's reign as the Parsons paradise, uh, because uh, whatever William and Mary did, Anne upped everything uh, in terms of support for the church. So for example, she gave a small grant of land to Trinity Church New York of something like uh, you know, 80 acres around Wall Street uh, that have uh, to this, which was well managed and it makes um, that church perhaps the wealthiest church in the United States. So they have great resources as a result of gifts from Anne. She changed the law about certain church income which had been seized from the church back in the days of Henry VIII and created what they call Queen Anne's Bounty. And that was a fund that helped small parishes with financial needs in England and in Ireland. It was used uh, for anyone to pay the passage. If you wanted to be a missionary in North America, you could get Queen Anne's Bounty, basically a scholarship to pay your passage to the New World. And then in some cases, uh, out of Queen Anne's bounty or as individual gifts from her, communion silver was given to congregations. So this is an interesting picture. This is the um, communion silver at Farnham Church in the Northern Neck, uh, Farnham and St. John's Warsaw um, uh, use this uh, from time to time. Most parishes that had Queen Anne silver don't have it anymore. And the reason for that is that after the American Revolution, the Virginia legislature seized uh, all the, um, the silver of vacant parishes and sold it. Um, this uh, silver is at uh, Farnham Church because um, uh, one of the members of the congregation who was a tailor uh, bought it back after it had been seized gave it to an Episcopal church, one of the two Christ churches in Washington. I don't know if it's the one that uh, where um, Crystal Harden was or not, or the one on Capitol Hill, but in any case, uh, uh, one of the uh, Christ churches um, bought the silver and gave it back uh, about in the last 20 years. Uh, and so Farnham Church now has their Queen Anne silver. Uh, finally, in 1713, Queen Anne was convinced to support legislation that would provide for a bishop uh, 
in one of the American colonies. She died before there was a vote on it and the vote was never taken. Uh, but uh, had she lived another year, um, there might have been in colonial Virginia uh, or in the colonial um, British colonies, a, a bishop about 50 years before that uh, or 75 years before that actually happened. So I'll pause at this point and if you have questions or uh, have heard questions, uh, well, I have, first of all, I want to point out that Greg put a link to the book that you mentioned, uh, Managing White Supremacy, in case anybody hasn't seen that, <clears throat> but I always have questions. Um, well, let me start with what you just said. The bishop um, would have been a really nice thing back then, because my understanding is that they could not have ordained anybody unless they went to England at this point, and so uh, it makes it a little complicated for people wanting to participate as clergy. Is that, was that a correct that, assumption there? That's correct. Anybody in the Church of England, the Roman Catholic Church, even in the Dutch Reformed Church or the German Reformed Church would have to go back to Europe for ordination. Okay, so that uh, would make it... This, this may be why the Congregational Church was the largest colonial church. They were one of the few churches that would ordain people locally. So that would make it pretty hard for a lot of the Native Americans and, and other people who were not from England to really participate in the uh, leadership, I guess, of the church. And it seems to me that that would have been a nice thing to do. You would have gotten more buy-in, shall we say, if uh, they yeah, had more a more native leadership. More, uh, yeah, if they had a little more. Is that a correct assumption there, too? I think that's true. Uh, one of the things that happened, one of the reasons for William and Mary was at least we had uh, Virginia increasingly would have uh, locally trained clergy. So okay. you go to William and Mary, you still had to go to England for ordination. Um, the Roman Catholics uh, would either go to France or um, initially they could also go to, to uh, Quebec uh, for ordination. So I guess all of my questions really deal with how, it, how could they have accelerated um, the progress and the other thought that I had was actually uh, piqued by the fact that they're starting schools. And I think that was a good idea because that gets people engaged and uh, more connected. And the other thing that I was curious about is back then, when did the practice of uh, giving charity um, to the local people become really prominent? And you know, I think that's what I understand from here in, in Virginia, there was an awful lot of support that was provided by the church and that obviously keeps people engaged. Well, I, the, um, in effect uh, in Virginia until the revolution, church, is, church of England was the welfare agency. And so, uh, but what that meant in effect was if you were a widow or an orphan or you were ill and you need medical care, the vestry would pay a parishioner or a member of the community to provide that care. So uh, what would happen is you would go to Vestryman and you'd say, uh, well, Mr. Miller died and he had six children. Uh, and so we are, they often, we, we pay this family to feed them uh, and they need clothing. So this is their food allowance. Um, somebody died and there was no one to provide for the burial. Uh, the vestry would pay somebody for the burial. Uh, you know, someone's ill and needs someone to care for them. Somebody with a household would care for them. So um, at the American Revolution and the disestablishment of the church, um, the uh, state created the overseers of the poor. And the overseers of the poor, in some cases, were the identical people who were on the vestry, but they were a separate body. So they would do one function and then go on to the other function. Uh, and, and I would guess that in, uh, well, in Massachusetts uh, and Connecticut and New Hampshire, where the Congregational Church was established, the Congregational Church uh, filled that same kind of function. It would have been the public welfare agency for the area. The long history to that then. <laughs> uh, there is another question. Uh, yeah. Father Stewart asked, was confirmation not a prerequisite for being put on the vestry? Ah, so there is a, there's an interesting uh, loophole in the Book of Common Prayer of 1662. Uh, 
th those who have been to fiscal planning for a long time remember that before 1970, you, you were not even to receive communion if you were not confirmed. And the, the 1928 prayer book and all our previous prayer books had a, had a communion rubric uh, that, that talked about the confirmed receiving communion. So, um, but the, uh, in 1662, when the prayer book was um, revised, the prayer book was revised with, a, uh, with the addition of the words ready and desirous. And so what is this? To be confirmed, to receive communion, you have to be confirmed or be ready and desirous to be confirmed. Uh, and in fact, um, when I was growing up, you know, one of the confirmation books that was used in confirmation class was titled Ready and Desirous uh, based on that rubric. So what that meant in the colonies was that if you wanted to be, a, if you were a, a, a communicant, you want to receive communion in the parish, what you would do is you, the, you would be prepared for confirmation by the rector. And then there would be a big service in which you would be preached to about the importance of the occasion and you'd be admitted to communion because you were ready and desirous for communion, but you couldn't actually be, or for confirmation, but you couldn't be confirmed. Uh, and so that was a, the, the kind of um, loophole. And some of those services were kind of like revival services, in, at least in Virginia and other places that they, they probably were more solemn. Um, and some of the sermon, I've read some of the sermons that were preached at, at such services. So uh, if you were a communicant, then you could be elected to the vestry. But you didn't have to be confirmed. You just had to want to be confirmed. Okay. <laughs> which, is kind of, which answers the question, you know, that used to be the question people would ask me, you know, how in the entire colonial era did anybody ever receive communion because they, they were not confirmed? Well, they didn't have to be, they just had to be ready to be confirmed. And there's one, one last comment here before yes. we proceed. Um, this is from Barbara. It's actually a comment, I think, um, rather than a question, if I'm right here. But in looking through the parish vestry book, and colonial court records, it often seemed that the vestry and justice of the court were the same people. And the vestry was responsible for pooling the parish, or polling the parish, excuse me, which seemed to coincide with the road surveyors who inspected roads and ordered landowners to make repairs. It, it is the case, you know, what happened is that uh, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, all the things that monasteries used to do got handed over to parishes, to the vestry. And uh, so the, uh, we have a rogation service and, you know, the, the, the uh, in any case, the, um, the vestry would hire people to check where the boundaries were as a kind of ministry to stop fights between people in uh, areas. Uh, and so people were, I guess, processioners. They would proceed around the parish uh, often in the spring and uh, identify uh, where the property lines were. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot of places in Virginia, the Episcopal Church and the courthouse not only are close together, but kind of looks suspiciously like one another uh, in, in construction. So they, there was a sense in which those functions overlap. Well, thank you. I guess uh, we can have more questions later. Okay. Um, I'd like to say a word about one of my favorite people, and he's a, a whiz kid of the uh, Church of England. His name is Thomas Bray. And he went to Oxford and graduated before he reached the age of ordination, but knew he wanted to be ordained. And so in his uh, spare time in the next couple of years waiting to uh, reach the age of 23, he wrote a bestseller, uh, which was called Catechetical Lectures. Um, and it would be a popular title for the next 200 years. Um, it was uh, published finally in 1697, but he was working on it long before then, and parts of it were done, um, but published in a big folio kind of edition. He made uh, what would become a kind of uh, ingenious and not particularly ecumenically friendly argument uh, in his book. Um, th there's a, a school of theology that Presbyterians and Congregationalists and Reformed Christians adopted uh, in the 17th century called covenant theology. And it was an attempt to answer questions about assurance and predestination. Um, 
all the churches of the Reformation, Protestant churches, uh, adopted a doctrine of predestination. That is, I am not saved because I've earned my salvation, but God chose me. And that's all right in the first generation, but later generations get anxious. How do I know God chose me? Well, um, if you ask uh, people in 1620 or 1590, it's, uh, well, I know what side I'm on because there's somebody over there who wants to burn me at the stake. Uh, and, and so it's pretty clear that I've made a, a major choice. Uh, but um, by 1620, uh, a lot of people uh, who had been raised in Protestant houses uh, were confused about how you knew whether you were part of God's grace or not. And so theologians in England uh, and in Holland worked out this theory uh, of uh, covenant theology. And, th and the answer was this, when God chooses you, God chooses you by bringing you into a covenant relationship in which you live with repentance and faith and God gives you forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. And while you can't uh, by yourself save yourself, what you can do is you can look and see if you're doing the things that the covenant implies. And if you're doing those, you're part of the covenant and you don't have to worry because you couldn't do them without God's grace. So if you're living with repentance faith, so it's a kind of nice, uh, a, a nice argument. No, what Bray did was he added kind of a little cat caveat. Um, and another part of the covenant, he said, was you live in a church with clergy who are authorized by Christ to lead the church. And those are only clergy ordained by bishops. And therefore, God does not have to answer the prayers of Presbyterian clergy. Um, now, many of the Presbyterians at the same time were arguing that the Church of England was too lax and that they uh, were not part of God's covenant either. But this was a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of patient uh, argument that uh, was used. Um, and so this becomes uh, a sort of a basic argument that is advanced by people uh, for much of the next 200 years. Um, a bishop of New York in um, uh, 1810 got in the debate with the Presbyterian clergyman and uh, the Presbyterian clergyman said, uh, you've given us a choice uh, between uh, episcopacy or perdition. You know, bishops are going to hell. And interestingly, the bishop did not deny that that's what he was doing, but it's, a, uh, it's a, as I say, not a highly ecumenical kind of argument. Um, Bray in uh, 1696 was appointed by Bishop Compton to be the first commissary in Maryland. But he was a careful man and he didn't actually get there for four years. Um, he wrote another book, A General View, in which he surveyed the condition of the Church of England and all the colonies. Then he uh, created a society called the Society for the Promoting of Christian Knowledge, the SPCK. Uh, which um, gave clergy and churches sets of books uh, that they could use to convince people of the validity of the Church of England. Uh, his catechetical lectures was one of them, but also on books on science and other things. So these were the earliest libraries in America, SBCK libraries uh, centered in, in various churches. He arrived in Maryland persuaded members of the Calvert family to make the Church of England the established church in Maryland and, um, and to uh, create a, uh, a support for the Church of England. And the legislature agreed in Maryland, but they said they added a codicil he didn't want. And that was uh, provided, we will do this, provided that no state money can ever be used to pay the salary of the commissary. Um, and so he had no salary and he left Maryland, went and never came back, went to England uh, and then created the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, which was a society to pay the salary for missionary clergy in British colonies. Um, so he, I mean, he was just always thinking of things to do. Um, the missionaries sent by that body 
uh, were dubbed Anglican Jesuits by Benjamin Franklin uh, because of their fervor and interest in, in converting people. And they had a very in-your-face approach. Uh, their first, their second um, minister was a guy named George Keith. Um, he uh, visited Massachusetts and he challenged Increase Mather, the Congregational Patriarch, to a public debate on the validity of Increase Mather's ordination. And then he cha challenged the whole graduating class of Harvard uh, to a debate on predestination in which he argued that the position of the um, Congregational Church was wrong. Uh, so very sort of brash. Uh, this kind of strategy struck pay dirt in 1722 when an Anglican missionary um, set up a, a reading a group among faculty members and tutors at Yale College and converted the entire faculty to the Church of England at an Anglican school, at a congregational school. Um, this is a picture, this is a, allegedly from Yale, a woodcut of one of those people, uh, uh, Timothy uh, Cutler, uh, who uh, is standing near the table talking to the Board of Trustees. Um, uh, Cutler um, uh, was one who went to England, was ordained and came back and became a leader of the Church of England in New England. Another uh, was uh, Samuel Johnson, not the English Samuel Johnson, but an, another Samuel Johnson. Um, and they all, um, they converted uh, Church of England and they were converted particularly because of uh, the argument that uh, their ministry was invalid and therefore God didn't have to hear their prayers. So they went to England for ordination and became a zealous Church of England. Uh, this kind of uh, holding high the importance of episcopacy is really the origin of the term high church. Uh, it didn't mean initially anything about liturgical style, but it was uh, we hold high the absolute necessity and validity of Episcopal ministry, and we uh, say unkind things about everybody else. The SPG missionaries, uh, in addition to trying to convert Protestants of other backgrounds, uh, uh, did a, a pretty good job of uh, Native American ministry. Uh, this, pic this picture here, you, you would have to do a close-up to look at it on the right-hand side. Um, it looks a little bit like the uh, altar at Christ Church uh, with the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and the Creed all the way up in front, except it's in Mohawk. Uh, this is the Mohawk chapter. Um, the there was an interesting kind of uh, breakdown. The two largest groups of Native Americans uh, in the North United States were the Iroquois Federation, the so-called five or six tribes of Western New York, who all, uh, Onondaga Sioux and others, a Mohawk, who all spoke uh, Iroquoian languages. And then across the river, um, Algonquian tribes of whom the Ojibwe may be uh, the most uh, prominent, uh, but who are also uh, who are also called Anishinaabe. Um, and those two groups were in a major trade war about who uh, controlled the trade uh, coming through the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. Um, and uh, what they did was they sort of played the English in Quebec and I mean the English in the South and the French in Quebec off against each other. So the Iroquois um, ended up siding with the English and the Algonquins uh, with the French. And um, one of the uh, results of that was that uh, the Iroquoian people include many Anglicans and the Algonquins are almost all Roman Catholics because they were, they allied with different groups and so um, if the Iroquois wanted to attack the Algonquin, they'd go tell the English that the Algonquins had just done some terrible thing. Uh, and the, the Algonquins did the same thing to the French because they wanted the English and French guns fired at uh, their opponents. Uh, and, uh, but it did open a possibility for mission. There, there's a, a man uh, named Thayendanega, also called Joseph Brandt, uh, who was a chief among the uh, Mohawk translated the Book of Common Prayer into Mohawk. Uh, at the American Revolution, he would 
cross the border and that's why he's buried at the Mohawk Chapel in Ontario. Uh, and he led many of the pro-English uh, tribes of the American Revolution into Canada. Uh, Thurgood Moore was the first SPG missionary sent uh, to uh, go to Native Americans. And he went through a, a crisis, which I guess was common for many people. Uh, some people wanted him to um, minister to the colonists rather than going to the Indians that he hoped to serve. And he got sort of caught between uh, some hesitation on the Iroquois part and pressure on the English part. And he ended up in a congregation where he insulted the Lieutenant Governor for behaving as governors of New York seem to do from time to time uh, and um, was uh, forced to go back to England as a result of that, um, had a short stay. But questions and comments? Well, there aren't in the chat, any in the chat box. I have one that hopefully you yeah. can ask, answer quickly, but um, you just mentioned that there was a, an effort to, let's see, how shall I say this? There was a practice of ministering to the Native Americans or to the uh, colonists. And there was no, was there any attempt to do it all in one congregation or was this just uh, a, had to take a different approach for each of the populations? Uh -huh. Well, I think the problem was they were geographically in different places. Okay. So in case of Thurgood Moore, it was Western New York or, or uh, Jersey, which was in part of the New York colony. Okay. Uh, so there was uh, several hundred miles separating the two. Um, okay. But, uh, good but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a good question. Uh, and some of the efforts uh, over time would be led by people who also uh, dealt with English language congregations. Um, and, language uh, is a problem. Yes, but uh, language is a problem. <laughs> well, that's it, uh, at least not for now. Oh, okay, so uh, just the uh, thing that's been in the newspaper. Um, at the end of Thomas Bray's life, uh, he founded a third missionary society, which was called Dr. Bray's Associates. And Dr. Bray's Associates um, devoted itself to the education and the evangelization of uh, African Americans. There were schools in Philadelphia, Williamsburg, Virginia, New York, Newport, Rhode Island, and Fredericksburg, Virginia. And those schools, I've been confused by um, what was going on in uh, some of what's been read in the paper about this is the building in which the Williamsburg school was located. Uh, some people were saying that uh, they didn't teach anybody how to read because it was against the law. And then they cited laws from the 1820s, uh, uh, which of course would not have affected what you were doing a century earlier. Uh, they, they did try to uh, teach people how to read and write and how to use the Book of Common Prayer. And um, one of the interesting things is that uh, when there were revivals in the uh, Church of England as part of the Great Awakening, the most uh, active congregations were often those that were also connected with uh, these schools. And I, I, I don't know why that is, but I, I can guess. Uh, and that is the, um, it could be that those who preached to uh, uh, congregations and taught people had to adopt uh, necessarily methods of communication that were um, better uh, suited to the people who were in those congregations. Uh, fewer Latin epigrams, uh, fewer dissertations of great length when you didn't look at people using big words that weren't understood. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, the people who learned how to do that also turned out to be good revivalist preachers. And so there's a kind of overlap. Um, last thought is, uh, if you look closely at my uh, red coat picture, you'll notice they're wearing COVID masks. So it's not a, an original, uh, <laughs> it's not a an entirely accurate reconstruction. Um, but uh, one of the stories which leads into next week is that the three missionary societies that were supported by um, Thomas Bray, 
all had in their charters a provision that their operation was to be limited to British colonies. And what that meant was with the American Revolution, all that financial aid stopped. So uh, if you look at what happened to the uh, Dr. Bray's associate schools, they all had closed by 1776. Um, so I think the school in Philadelphia was later picked up by the local parish um, or there was a successor group. And uh, the missionaries that were supported by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel to Native Americans uh, either uh, traveled with Native Americans into Canada or they uh, lost their salaries. And so the Church of England uh, had to um, reorganize in terms of mission and that will be the topic of next week. So any final comments before we head on to even prayer to uh, Compline? I don't see any in the box. So thank you for uh, clarifying a couple of things and for those who ask questions. Okay, so uh, last question I was asked once is, uh, where's the word Compline come from? <laughs> it, it's from the word for complete because it's the last of the seven hours, uh, daytime hours of prayer. And so uh, when you got here, you kind of, uh, it's, we're finished almost, you know, so it's bedtime prayers, but it's, uh, in Spanish, it's called completas, ah. uh, which it's a little clearer that it's just complete. So we're gonna complete the evening. Um, So, so if Crystal uh, wants to share her, try sharing her screen now, if she wants to share her screen. Yes, yeah, so I'll stop mine. Yeah, no worries. And I'll share mine. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. So yeah, let us, let's just take just a few moments to quiet our minds and hearts and then we can begin. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make speed to help us. Glory to the, Glory Father, to the Father, and to the Son, the Son and to the Holy, the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and will be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Let us say Psalm 4 responsively by half verse. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the, the Lord, he will he hear, will hear me. me. Tremble then and do not sin. Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices. And put your trust in the Lord. In the Lord. Many are saying, oh, that we might see better times. Lift up Lift the light, the light of, your of your countenance upon us, O Lord. 
You have put gladness in my heart. More than grain and wine and oil and grease. I lie down in peace. At once I fall asleep. For only you, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be, and will be forever. Amen. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed, redeemed me, O Lord, O God, God of truth. truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead, and lead us, us not, not into temptation, but deliver, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night and give your angels charge over those who are asleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Amen. I now invite your intercessions and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. Brother Christopher. In thanksgiving for the life and ministry of Bill Weiler, and for Carol and all who mourn his death. Now, if you'll join me. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, sleeping, that awake awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have have set which servant free, go in in peace peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world world to see. see. A light, a light to enlighten, enlighten the Gentiles and the glory, the glory of your people, Israel. Israel. Glory, glory, glory to the Father, Father and to the and Son and to the, and to the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was, as it was in the beginning, as it is now, now, and will be, be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Guide us waking, us waking o Lord, 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 and guard us sleeping. That awake we, we may watch with Christ, Christ, and asleep we may rest, rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Almighty, merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen.
Thank you all. Thank you, Bob. That was very interesting. Thank you, Bob. If you've uh, kept your old newspapers, you can look back on the story about the uh, Bray School. And, uh... All right. Thank you very Thank much you. for your yeah. wisdom and information. Yep. Thank no, you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Greg, thank you for keeping us on track. And mm -hmm. See you next week. Thank you, Ann. All right. Thank you. Hopefully before. Bye. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll bring some friends next time, too. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, uh, Revo. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. This was awesome. <laughs>